Hello, everybody. You're about to meet Dr. Melissa Ochoa, who has expertise in race, ethnic studies, and gender. I invited her to this conversation to talk about her article on the use of the term Latinx. So here's some background. As you may know, if you've been following me or this blog, I've been through several ethnic identifications in my lifetime. As a child, we were Negroes. Then we became Black and then African-American. And now I use the terms Black and African-American more or less interchangeably. I knew the Latin community was going through a similar transformation. When I started teaching at the University of Houston, the students were generally considering themselves Hispanic, but then the term Chicana or Chicano came into popularity. Fast forward a few decades, many moons, and the term Latinx emerged. Recently, I ran across an article that explained the problems with the term Latinx. And that article was written by Melissa. And so here she is to explain all of this to you. Hello, everybody. I am delighted to bring to you Melissa Ochoa. Okay. She is an assistant professor of women and gender studies at St. Louis University. She, she has a PhD in sociology. Her interest is in race and ethnic relations, social psych, which is my interest, social psychology. And I, she caught my eye because she wrote this article on why Latinx is not the preferred term. I was totally fascinated by that. And we contacted her to see if she'd be willing to be interviewed. I'm planning to ask Melissa about this and other subjects related to what I used to call the Latinx community, <laughs> but Melissa is about to set me straight. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me, Jean. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share more about my article and uh, my research. Totally looking forward to it. Okay, so, but before we begin, let's get some background on you so people will know where you're coming from. Just tell us about, a little bit about where and how you grew up, why you entered into this area of women's, uh, women, gender, race, ethnicity, all of that. Yeah, so my background is a little bit interesting. Um, my parents are Mexican. My mom was born in the United States and then she moved to Mexico, fell in love with my dad. And we were all born there. We were supposed to live there. And then we came just to the US. Uh, it was supposed to be on a temporary basis. And we ended up staying, starting a business. My parents started a business. And my dad, as, as you can see, I'm white passing. So we all have white privilege, even though my dad had to learn English in his later 20s, he's blonde, blue eyed. So, oh, yes. So I've had an interesting growing up experience because even though we were raised in the States, uh, all of our family, well, most of our family, my grandma, my grandpa and my aunts and uncles and cousins were still in Mexico. So I would spend all of my summers and winters in Mexico and then my schooling and the rest of the year here. And so I would have this dual cultural experience and it wasn't until, uh, you know, it was very normal for me. I'd go there and you would just adjust to the culture and customs there. You'd come back and you'd adjust to the. So it, it, then I would start to get confronted with little things. Like I remember in uh, elementary school bringing some Mexican candy to my schoolmates that were all white. And they were like, oh, that looks so ugly. That looks terrible. And it's like, oh, does it? I guess I never noticed. And so starting from very little, I started to see these um, little bit of conflicts. And then as I got older, the cultural barriers of being perceived as, as more family oriented, maybe, uh, you know, not as 
uh, I don't want to use, okay, I'm trying to think of the right word here. Uh, I don't want to say, well, as exploratory uh, in some ways that Americans are known for and seen as very conservative. Um, so, but then I'd go to Mexico and I would be very liberal. And so find feeling like I just didn't really fit in anywhere. And then that kind of just spurred my interest in, okay, there's these cultural differences. How do I negotiate that? How do I uh, live like that? And uh, when I went to undergrad, I studied psychology because of it and uh, communication because of it. Uh, I wanted to understand more how culture, culture impacts someone's upbringing and the way they just go throughout life. Whoa, that is fascinating. So I, I, I got stumped on the blonde and blue hair business. And so is that because somewhere in a, obviously a European is in some ancestry? Probably, yes, probably. You don't we, know? No, well, we can't really, uh, we can't trace it. Uh, at least we haven't tried, but uh, there's an assumption there, probably. Probably there is some European ancestry. So, um, okay. And, and that was a big part of it, too. You know, seeing the way whiteness granted me privilege in Mexico and the way that differed from the privilege I got from in the U.S. And so in the U.S., I got to see and experience, you know, what Pika and Fagan refer to as backstage racism, where- Say that word again, backstage? Back, backstage racism. Okay, and who was the author that you spell his name? Pika uh, and Fagan. Oh, okay, and Joe Fagan, okay. Joe Fagan, yes, Leslie okay. Pika and Joe Fagan. Uh, they came, uh, they wrote a book called Two-Faced Racism, where they talk about front stage racism and backstage racism, um, and talked a lot about how racism hasn't really disappeared. It's only gone backstage. Now, of course, this is <laughs> That's a Trump era, you know, this is pre-Trump era now, you know, things might be different. Um, but in the, um, a backstage racism setting, it's a group of all whites where they feel that they can share racist jokes or they can say what they want to say. And being white passing, I got to experience that uh, where people would freely say whatever they wanted. And then I would, I would got the opportunity to put them in their place, something that they probably would never expect. So that all played into my experience of multiculturality and uh, why I studied what I chose to study. Most academics choose topics that hit close to home for them. And that certainly was the case for me. Yeah, me too. So let's, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get to what I asked you for, but I'm so fascinated by what you're saying that my head is going around. I have a lot of thoughts. Okay, so first, you used the word white passing rather than white appearing. And I hear some people say that. Now, in my world, there's a whole big difference between those two terms. Do you make a distinction? Between white passing and white appearing? Yes. So I don't make this di distinction. Okay. Um, I use white passing because I don't identify as white but I pass as white. Right. Uh, and so that's why I use white passing instead of appearing. White appearing for me is more phenotypically, whereas white passing is more about the social constructs connected to whiteness. Right. So when you say you're white passing, does that mean you choose it and you can flit in and out of being white as you choose or does it mean this is what others put on you? It's an imposed identity, yes. It's an imposed identity. Yes, now, because I am lighter skin and have lighter hair and I'm not what people would expect Mexicans to look like. And so in that sense, I'm white passing. Okay. I have nieces who are your complexion and from what I can see, your hair. And so they go in and out of 
what that means to be go to go into a store or a school or what have you and be seen is one thing. And at least one of them and others have deliberately, especially in earlier days, decided to let people think what they want because they wanted the advantages of being white. Right. The white privilege. That the comes white with. privilege. Absolutely. They wanted the white privilege. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know a so I know a little bit about that conflict. I personally haven't experienced, but I've heard enough, been in enough conversations about it and the pros and cons of that. So in the Mexican culture, you were white, you were white appearing, white passing. You got the privileges from there. Here you learned more of the downsides even because people thought they were talking to their own. Is that what you're saying? Well, it depends on how you see it. Uh, it might not be a downside for me. So I long determined that I would use my white privilege as a means of educating about racism. So we do know that white people tend to listen to other white people about racism. And so I use it in that sense so that um, I am speaking for my people. I'm speaking on behalf of, of those that are not being heard, though they should be heard. So that's that's the way I see it. I um, So it depends on, I guess, your viewpoint. I think that's beautiful that you. you're, you're making a conscious decision to take what could be an asset to spiral you up somewhere or a detriment, depending on what group you're identifying with or among. And you're taking that and saying, I have an asset that I can use to advance a cause I believe in, my to advance my people. And so I'm going to do that. And I've especially found it fruitful in the classroom. So I was teaching at Texas A&M University, which is a predominantly white institution. And um, I never revealed my racial identity, my immigrant status, you know, my Spanish as the first language until the very end of the semester. Wow. And that was very intentional because it was a double lesson. So one, I wanted my white students to really grasp the lessons I was learning, you know, teaching them and not shut me out. And two, I wanted what they learned throughout the whole semester to accumulate to this one final moment of the semester where they had to self-reflect on how they would have treated me, how they would have perceived me, had I been darker skinned, had I had an accent. Had I, you know, struggled speaking English, had I uh, shared I was an immigrant, you know, all these other things. And, you know, most of them walk away with, yeah, you're right. I probably would have dismissed everything you had to say Whoa. with that kind of a lesson. And um, and it is a little bit hard for me, though. That is a difficult choice because it is a predominantly white institution and there are students of color. And it's like, I would love to shout it out and be like, I'm here for you. I'm also first generation. And, you know, but I typically found that those were the students that would come to my office and they would say, I have to ask, your last name is Ochoa. I was expecting a Spanish speaking and I would like, okay, just don't tell the class, but here's, here, you're in on a little secret here. And so I still got to bond with, you know, some students of color while still maintaining the larger lesson of the impacts of systemic racism and, you know, attitudes of immigration, especially so close to the border in Texas and all those other lessons that I want white students to walk away from. I want students of color to feel validated but I want white students to walk away because those are the people that are going to impact the other people that are, you know, white. So I'm going to ask you a really global question. Mm -hmm. I know what you want them to walk away with depends on which of course you're teaching, which specific course you're teaching, but you're teaching in a same area, regardless of the course. Is there an overarching message you want the white students to walk away with? Absolutely. So regardless of whether I'm teaching violence against women or 
intro to sociology or intro to gender society or even U.S. immigration uh, on U.S.-Mexico border. I always start with a very brief overlap of uh, history, American history, you know, the history we were not taught in schools, because I want students to understand the way race is socially constructed and the way this country was founded on racism and sexism. And everything that we're learning is intersectional. So it's hard for them to grasp that if they first don't understand historical perspectives. Uh, this isn't something new. It's just ways that it's continued to exist in new in new ways. You know, the systems of oppression have remained the same. They just look might look a little different than what they did, you know, 100 years ago. OK, so let's connect intersectionality for those who don't know what it is. First, define it and then tell explain again how you fit intersectionality into your overarching message. Yeah, so Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term, uh, but other women of color scholars from Latinas and other Black women have long been talking about this on how their experiences as women of color uh, differed from white women and how there might have been some overlap because of, you know, being same gender, but in actuality, theirs was a totally different experience because of the intersections of race and gender. And this is also true for sexual orientation, um, even, you know, colorism, all, all of these different aspects. So that that is where, uh, that is a starting point for me in the classroom is to make sure that we're getting these different experiences and we're hearing these different voices. Okay, so some students then may walk in from their small town into your classroom and think we're all the same. And your goal is for them to say, not exactly. Yes, uh, not so much we're all the same, but they buy into this American ideology of meritocracy and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. They don't see the structural barriers that some social groups face more than others because of race, because of gender, because of sexual orientation, um, because of socioeconomic status. And then there's very lack of understanding of the way these things are related to each other, how socioeconomic status is related to gender, how it's related to race. And so it's putting those pieces together. And I'm a big believer on not telling students what to think what to believe. And in fact, a lot of my evaluations will say, you know, for the most part, you know, my political views are so different, but I actually learned so much in this class um, because I just kind of tuck out the puzzle pieces here. And then it's so much more impactful when students have to put these pieces together. And of course, all of my courses are, you know, very feminist based. So it's their discussion oriented and they're empathetic. They're from a place of empathy, which I find is the best form of knowledge is empathy. And um, it's much more impactful. So like you said, a lot of these students, especially, you know, talking about Texas A&M, they were coming from really small white rural towns you know, to them, moving to college was like New York City, you know, huge. So that was the first time they'd ever experienced a transgender student. So hearing what their parents say about it, what their religion says about it, what their political views say about it versus, oh, there's another first year student, 18 year old trans woman who's struggling. Oh, she's just like me. And she's going through what I'm going through and, but worse because she has to deal with X, Y, and Z. Um, it's different. Now it's not just this abstract perspective, this, you know, something we're learning in a book. Now it's, I know someone who's sitting next to me, you know, and that has been very impactful, I think, for students to hear about racism firsthand, sexism firsthand, their experiences as trans. And um, again, I, I find that empathy is very powerful. Well, you just gave me my infusion of hope for the day. I, I just listening to you talk literally gave me 
goosebumps and said, if this one person is in this one university in middle of America, think of all the others who are doing what they can to spread a broader view of history all over this country. I mean, that's just wonderful. What you just said was beyond eloquent. I, it, 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 it was, it's like a truth that we all need to know that who we are, our one limited perspective, there's, we can go broader, we can know more. And what I really like about what you said is not just the information about intersectionality, race, gender, ethnicity, all of that, not just the intellectual knowledge, but you're ad adding the emotional connection, empathy, and for a goal, explicit goal, apparently, that you have is people can feel this, not just understand it. Right. That lived experience that feminist scholarship speaks so much about. And I I want to also just emphasize that I'm not 100% there yet. I'm not perfect. And I tell my students that, too. I'm still learning. I will make mistakes. I plan on making mistakes because then that's how I learn and I grow and I do better. So even though I try, you know, my best to come from, you know, the most intersectional perspective, the most I'm still open to understanding that I will make mistakes and that I will need to be checked. Join the line. <laughs> <laughs> Join the land. It does not get easier as you get older. I promise you that. I know. I, I remember thinking, oh, yeah, when I get to be this age, I'll have it together. Uh -uh. That's not the way it, that's not the way it works. OK, so let's, let's go to Latinx. What's wrong with that? So I wanted to write this article for many, many years before I even finished my PhD in 2019. And I didn't because I wanted to get on the job market. And as someone who is looking for diversity and inclusion and jobs that are about racism and sexism, many of the job ads had Latinx on there. So I did not want the <laughs> universities to look me up and say, well, we can't hire this person because... She hates Latinx. Um, <laughs> and so, so you do not want to apply for a job telling the interviewers <laughs> you're using an outmoded elitist term. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Didn't, thought that was not a good idea. So I had had this article kind of ruminating in my 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 head for many many years, and when I first thought I wanted to write it, I um, was thinking that my sole audience was going to be academics. Because these are the people that are publishing on it, they're using it, they're creating entire organizations around the word Latinx. So I knew that my main audience at that point was going to be academics. Well, I finally got a job that I absolutely love. And it is my first semester here at St. Louis University, but I love it. And I can see myself probably being taken out in a coffin here. So um, <laughs> as soon as I got hired... I contacted the conversation, I pitched this article idea, and they were all for it, thankfully. And, you know, the universe does its thing because it was perfect timing. At that point, Argentina and Spain had made public statements banning not only Latinx, but also Latine which was what the article was about. So, and so I had the opportunity then to speak to three different audiences, not only academics, but Spanish speakers in Spanish speaking countries, which uh, my aunt and I just rewrote the article in Spanish and it's hopefully gonna be released in Spanish speaking countries in the next week or so. And uh, so no we'll see good. how- it gets received. congratulations. Thank you. We'll see how it gets received in that sense. And then just the everyday U.S. Uh, person who might not identify with Latinx. Um, so I got the opportunity to write to those three different audiences. Okay. And Wait, let's summarize the three different audiences. One okay. is the uh, academics in this country. Mm -hmm. Second is Spanish speaking academics or just general in other in countries? In general, in general. Okay. And then the third are people everywhere who don't identify with either term. With Latinx. With Latinx. Okay. Got it. All mm -hmm. right. Yes. 
And so I, I went to writing this article that had been ruminating in my brain for so long. And uh, what I would really like your listeners and those that are your viewers to take away from this article. So I say a lot of things, um, but there are three main points that I really want to reiterate. And I'll say them and then I can go into detail about each one. So my first point that I make, which is the, uh, you know, the, the, sen the main point of the article is that Latinx is not inclusive. It's been sold that way. It's been gifted that way. Um, it's been, we've been told it was inclusive, but it's not. And I'll get into why it's not. Or do you want me to get into it now? Oh, no. I want you to explain that. In Spanish, Latina and Latino, the Spanish is a gendered language. Okay. So pave the way for why, how we even got to Latinx and then undo Latinx. Yes. So for those of you that are not familiar, Spanish is a gendered language, much like French um, and Italian. And so... Previously, Latina or Latino would be it was Latino is masculine, Latina is feminine. But there's also a rule in Spanish where you can have 100 people in a room, 99 of them are women, one is a man, and the plural will become masculine. It'll be Latinos. Wow. And so Latinx was really designed for two reasons. One, for the queer community. Uh, that did not identify as Latina or Latino, but also as a way to uh, create like a gender neutral form. So, and that is actually my second point. So my first point is that it's not inclusive. My second point is I don't want to villainize those that have used it and have, you know, created it or contributed to its usage because the intention was incredible. The intention of creating Latinx uh, creating a gender neutral form for the sake of inclusivity was great. I mean, we want to be more inclusive. So the intention was good. And I, I want to stress that, that it's not that people were being exclusive when they came up with this term, this term happened and people kind of just jumped on it. And the third point is though, that it's not as good of a term as the alternative, which is Latine. Okay, so I'd like you to emphasize these endings because I'm following along since I know these terms. Yeah. But for those who are not knowing the terms, I'd like you to emphasize them. So what you're saying is there's something wrong with a Latinx, which is that it's exclusive. It's, yes. Mm -hmm. The people who devise the X as the more inclusive term had good intentions. Mm -hmm. And three, we all is not lost if we're abandoning Latinx. We have an alternative that can still be inclusive, but that pass all the tests. That's right. All right. Latina. So Wait, take break them down. Right. Okay, so we'll start from the beginning of why Latinx is, is not inclusive. First and foremost, the general population does not use it. Uh, Gallup polls have found that less than 5% of Americans identify as Latinx or even know what it is. Uh, Pew Research Studies have found that it's less than 3%. So we can rest assured that at least less than 6% of the population know it, use it. And so that's first and foremost. Well, it who is, uses it? So, and that's the other catch here too. The people who do use it or do know what it is are people in positions of privilege. So that is um, predominantly English speakers. That is people who have at least some college education and they tend to be, they have citizenship and they tend to have younger, uh, they're younger. So they're the younger range. So the most vulnerable populations are not using Latinx. Um, but academics have embraced this term 
and they have been imposing this term onto the general population. And I, I just find it problematic anytime scholars are imposing identities onto people, especially populations that you're supposed to be representing. Uh, you're supposed to represent social groups, not tell them how they should identify. So that's a big issue for me. And that just screams not inclusive if people are not using it and if you have to impose it, not inclusive. Um, so I, when I read this in the article, I just literally almost hollered because I thought the sheer irony of attempting to get a more inclusive term in order to reach out and, and to do the right thing and to embrace diversity. <laughs> yes. And then it turns out to be a, an imposed term that the community that it's for doesn't want. Doesn't want. It does That's not so want. so hysterical. Yeah, exactly. And some scholars have sort of use Latinx as a means to erase gender. And I also find that problematic because I don't think our goal, at least not for me, is to eliminate gender, race, you know, sexual orientation. It's to, to create a world, create a society in which we all have the same social status and equal opportunities of outcome. We don't want this at least not for me, a blanket identity where we're all the same. Um, that just doesn't make sense to me and it doesn't seem very plausible. So I once had a reviewer and I mentioned this in the article that wrote on a paper that I had submitted for publication that I should not use Latina or Latino for my participants. I should replace it with Latinx. Both of them, I should replace it all with Latinx. I was very upset and wrote the editor about this reviewer's comments and said, I don't know who this reviewer is. Obviously, you know, peer reviews are anonymous. And, uh, but please, I want you to write to them. I want you to forward them my response. And I said, you know, as a Mexican woman, I find this appalling that this is okay for you to think that it's acceptable to impose an identity. Um, but Second, as a scholar who's trying to study the way sexism impacts women and men by race, how do you analyze that if it's all Latinx? That's so funny. And then on top of that, they had no issues with Black women, Black men, white men, white women. But I guess for the Latinx, they are all lumped together as one gender. You know, it just... And this is where I was really angry because I felt like, you know, people have jumped on this bandwagon of Latinx in this, for the sake of inclusivity that they're not actually realizing how it can be harmful in terms of gender, specifically looking at Latinas, how you can end up obscuring them even more because you're imposing a term that's supposed to disguise their gender, that's supposed to completely eliminate their gender. And so that's never okay. That's the real conundrum. Yes. And a friend of mine described, I think, cultural competence. And I'll give a shout out to her, Dr. Dario Funches. Cultural competence as seeing a difference when in fact the difference is meaningful mm -hmm. and not seeing the difference when the difference or not paying attention, ignoring the difference when the difference is not meaningful. It's something, I'm not paraphrasing her accurately, but it's along those lines. And so you're saying where they, we need to make a distinction between race and gender. Let's do that. And in the, in the Latina, Latina community, Latina, Latina mm -hmm. community, the difference is calling, referring to Latino or Latina. Mm -hmm. That's right. And there's a built-in term to make that distinction. That's right. They're built in gender terms. Yes. Uh, and so for people to want to take that away when those people want to identify that, that way is not OK, because that was the other issue, too. These are how my participants identify. They identified as Latinos and Latinas, not as Latinx. 
So I'm not going to say, oh, well, too bad. You identify as a Latina. You're a Latina now. <laughs> um, that was, I was just not okay with that. And honestly, no scholar academic should ever be okay with that. Um, when you're collecting data, unless, you know, your focus is identity, then that's, you know, a separate study. But, okay. and another reason why it's not inclusive is because it does not work in Spanish. It does not work in Spanish. So, if the goal of Latinx is to make it gender neutral, then it has to work beyond one umbrella term. It has to work in other ways that people identify. Right. And that could mean through, uh, you know, their nationalities, you know, home countries, or that can mean as non-binary individuals. So for me, I think the moment I kind of stopped in my tracks and said, actually, I think Latinx is not a good idea because initially I thought it was a good idea. You know, I think it was important to have a gender neutral term was when I started seeing people write LXS Latinx. <laughs> so instead of las and los, which are articles for, you know, the, but they're gendered, they decided to remove the A and the O like they did for Latina and Latino and replace it with an X. The problem is I can't even begin, Jean, to tell you how you would say that. And I started seeing this for the pronouns, E-L-L-X, instead of, you know, ella, E-L-L-A, which is she, and el, which is E-L, you know, for him. E-L-L-X, how do you pronounce that? So I started seeing this on paper. I'm like, it's not okay to have something written, but then you can't even verbalize it. You know, you can't produce it verbally. And so that's when I stopped in my tracks and said, you know, I don't think Latinx is actually as good as I initially thought. And then along, you know, sometime after that is when I came across the alternative term, which I'll get to in a minute. But it's incredibly problematic if it doesn't fit in Spanish because it's it's supposed to be for Spanish speakers. And obviously, if we're trying to make something gender neutral, it shouldn't just be for the U.S. community. We should make it accessible for all Spanish speakers. Um, so my second point then is that the intention of Latinx was great. And I recognize that um, because we do know that language matters. We do know. And, you know, as I talk about in the article, the cognitive scientists have done all the research on gendered language and they show that it does impact your behavior, your biases, your discriminations on gender. Even the English language, it's not gendered, but there are certainly words that will trigger a gender. If I say bossy, you should see a gender. Um, for most people will. And in fact, that's why the term then girl boss was created to counter bossy. Uh, so we know that this is happening even in non, you know, in non-gendered language like English. So that this is this is key. So it was a good tool. It just there's one better. And that is Latine. That came shortly after. Latine. Mm -hmm. Latine. With an E at the end. With an E at the end. And the reason why this is better is it's coming directly from Spanish speakers in Spanish speaking countries. So it's being used already in Latin America among social activists. Um, it's being implemented already into other words because it works with Spanish, unlike the X, the E works. So where you couldn't do E-L-L-X, you can do E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Where you can't do L-X-S, you can do L-E-S. Ah, lay, which is in French, in French, the word is lay. Yes, and it's uh, in Spanish, it's les. So, okay. and, and you can make nationalities because uh, we do know that the majority of people don't identify with these umbrella terms of Latino, Hispanic. Um, they prefer either their country of origin or 
their family's country of origin. So they prefer to identify as Mexican, Colombian, where you can't really say Mexican X, right? Like it just doesn't, you can't, and in Spanish, you can't pronounce it, but you can say Mexican name or in Spanish, Mexicane. You can say the E for most of the nationalities, it works, uh, where the X just doesn't work for any of them. Uh, so it it is a more inclusive term for sure, more than Latinx. And it well, does- that's, in that's fascinating. Yes, so it, it works for non-binary individuals in that it gives them an identity other than Latina, Latino, and a pronoun. But it also works in general for gender neutrality. So that when there is a room of 99 women and one man, you know, one man, we don't have to say Latinos, you know, we can say Latines, where then the people, the listeners understand that it is mixed gender, you know, giving it's more than just men in that group. And it also differentiates. Okay, so then we definitely know it's not just men because there's sometimes the need for extra clarification in Spanish. When you say Latinos, you're like, wait, is it only men or you mean like plural? So there's sometimes that, that need for extra clarification that this would eliminate that problem. Okay, let me, let me, um, I'm losing a little part of it. Okay. So crowd of people, one man, 99 women. Latinx is doesn't make any sense, right? To say it with an X and then try to add an S after that. So that's one of the points you're making, correct? So Latinx, that's about the only thing it was good for in that sense was for that Latinx. Latin, yeah. yeah, but if it's plural. Right, you couldn't say it plural, no. You couldn't, you Latinx, to say Latinx. This. <laughs> that doesn't right. make sense. Right, you okay. have to say that. So X that. So now let's put the E there, Latin, Latine, and to make it plural, Latines. Mm -hmm. Latines. And that works. Yeah, that works. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that works. And uh, so this is a better alternative that I hope people will begin to adopt and they'll remove Latinx and stop using Latinx. I'm switching. Oh, thank you. <laughs> After I read that, I thought, what do I do with all these blog posts with an X in it? And I might go back and put in a footnote or something. There's a bunch of stuff that I've written in past blog. You know, this language, all of this is changing rapid fire, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, there are a lot of academics that fought really hard at the university level to get Latinx approved at a community level and organization level. And they might be like, oh, all our efforts were for naught, you know, and that's not true because it was the best term available at the time. But we all grow, we change, we learn and we evolve. Language evolves. And so, I don't know exactly how Latinx was known and Latina was not because I couldn't find the origins of Latina. So it could have just been two separate bubbles at the same time or one bubble came first and then the other bubble and the first bubble didn't notice the second bubble. I mean, it could be a, a number of reasons why that I didn't come up with this term. I'm just bringing awareness that this term already exists. Uh, it's not my term. So I well, I'm glad uh, you're an ambassador for us. Yeah, <laughs> I just, uh, you know, because I do think inclusivity is important and diversity is important and language does matter. I think we need to follow the science. And so why not? And I don't think it should be a replacement. We should not replace gender, but it could be an addition to the Spanish language that would work for some people. And it should be an acceptable addition to the Spanish language. I agree and i'm just trying I, and i hadn't even thought about what you have to go through to get it changed in academia you know your story of how that editor wanted to change you when my co-author and i wrote reframing change we capitalized black and the copy editor from the publisher sent everything back with small b 
and small w. So then we had I had to research and we had to find how we going to explain to them that black is a color is not the same as black as an ethnic identification. Right. Right. Those are two different things. And so the editor let it go, let it pass. And oh, let us good. So you, you fought for it. You fought for it. That's great. It was the deaf community that helped because I was able to find a reference that a small d is a physical condition. And a capital D is a deaf community. It's a community of people. So I said, ah, here's, here's the exact parallel. And wow. I think that's what won it over. Wow. Yes. Good for you. That is important. And I find a lot of things happen like that in academia for all its love of wanting knowledge and different thoughts. Sometimes it's not as uh, welcoming of different thoughts and contradictory knowledge. I get a lot of emails from academics across the country when I publish this article saying thank you. I've been trying to tell my colleagues for years that Latinx was not inclusive, people didn't like it, and I got labeled as someone who wasn't inclusive. I got labeled as someone who didn't care about diversity. And so they said, now I can use your article and not just say, see, Here's why Latinx isn't good, but <laughs> there's also an alternative, you know? So, you you know, the fact that you gave us another opportunity, because there were articles that already existed saying Latinx is not inclusive, but there hadn't been any articles that specified exactly the same points that I made and then offered an alternative. So that's where it differed. Well, I think this is wonderful. And Melissa, I had three other subjects I wanted to talk with you but I don't want to rush through them and we have an hour limitation. What I want to do is invite you back. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'll have you, I'll tell Virginia to schedule you and then we'll do a part two on the other topics on racialized sexism. I'll just say it from racialized sexism on ethnic identification as white by some Latinas and uh, there are other topics. So we're going to we're gonna round this out. But I think what we've talked about here is important enough. It should stand on its own. Okay. Okay. So I do want you to clarify one thing because it's part of the same conversation. Okay. Under what conditions you said the majority of people of a Latina Latina's background prefer to be identified with their home country. Mm -hmm. Do you have any understanding about that? Why that's so? And when to group, when not to group? Any advice for the listeners? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I, for starters, I want to, you know, make the point that most people don't really understand the differences between Hispanic and Latino, and they use them interchangeably. Um, they don't understand the historical uh, components of those words, the origins of the words, and how they're being used. They're not academics. Um, I do think it's important to make those distinctions so that people can choose the, the one that best identifies them. I don't think we need to impose identities, and, and I certainly don't want Latina to be that imposition if the community doesn't pick it up. If the community, I don't think that tomorrow the media should start using Latina and only Latina. I think we need to follow what people believe in, what they identify with. Um, Hispanic, a lot of people have strayed away from that and wanted to be more Latinos because Hispanic has the correlation with Spain and Latinos, don't want to be in the same boat as their colonizers. Right? People who identify as Latinos, short for Latino Americano, don't want to identify with their colonizers. So that's a distinction there. And a lot of Latinos might not be Spanish speakers, but Hispanics, for the most part, are considered to be Spanish speakers. So that's a distinction. But people are interesting because we have found patterns where People in urban areas are more likely to identify as Latinos and people in the rural areas are more likely to identify as Hispanic. 
Well, I had never heard that distinction before. Except in Florida. They like to identify as Hispanic. <laughs> so, um, so there are some, you know, uniqueness to it. And then some researchers who study identity, um, the way that, you know, Mexican Americans or Mexicans identify in the in the US have found nuances between like those that are on the California border versus those that are on the Texas border, or depending on your skin color or even how much money you make. Because it, you might have been a family living in Mexico with a lot of money and uh, class is whiteness. And so you come to the United States and you identify as white because you have this class privilege. You have this wealth that that's how you identify. And you want to stay away from being identified as Mexican or Latinos that are very racialized terms that are loaded with uh, you know, other connotations of immigration, citizenship, um, socioeconomic status, all of these things that are connected to that. And we know that Hispanic and Latino are racialized terms because when there are light skins, they'll say, you'll see light skinned Hispanic man or light skinned Latina woman. So then the default is what? That they're dark skinned brown. So it's already a racialized term. Uh, I know we got to I we got to bring you back now because this 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 <laughs> this is a huge topic. I will I, I will just make this comment. I was proudly using the term Hispanic maybe a, fifteen years ago until I had a grad student who was from Brazil, and she said Brazil was never owned by Spain, and so. And so to be inclusive, we had, we literally switched to Latinx at the time. A Latina, I don't think we had an X then with Latinas, Latinos, because mm -hmm. if we use Hispanic, she, she wasn't part of the, part of the mix. Right. That's right. And Spain okay. is not included in Latinos. Right. Okay. So we're going to just end this here. Is there anything in this general topic that we didn't cover? No, I, I think we've covered everything. I just really do want to stress the point that it's important not to impose identities. That's really important, even though I am standing by Latine, it's not something that we need to impose. But if you are going to use an inclusive term and then I think it's, you need to nix Latinx. Nix it, nix it, just X it out. Um, and replace it with Latine. Okay, so if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would they reach you? Absolutely. I have an email, Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot Ochoa, O-C-H-O-A at slu, S-L-U dot E-D-U. They can send me an email. Okay, put it in the chat also. I will. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, well, for it's having been me. a sheer delight. I did not know that this one topic is going to be so so in depth and uh, so uh, broad. I had because I had planned these other topics, but um, uh, you've been a delight. You've been informative, and I think I got it. And my major challenge now will be to pronounce it. But, <laughs> but. All you have to do is, you know, Latinas, Latinos, it's the same thing. Because, you know, a lot of people would say Latinx. And it's not Latinx because we don't say Latinos. We don't say Latinase. Oh, I've been it's saying Latinx. <laughs> yeah. You have to say it the way you would la Latinos. So Latinos, Latina. Okay, Latina. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you. And we will be in touch. It's been a sheer delight. Okay, sounds good. Well, that cleared up a lot for me. I'm glad to know that Latine is the new preferred term. So here are my takeaways. First, language is constantly evolving. If you have any cynicism about this and wish for all people in some community to choose one term and just stick to it forever and ever. That's just not the way language works. I already 
describe my own personal transformation, my community's transformation from Negro to Black to African American. So here's another term. I was raised with the term crippled, which then became handicapped, which became disabled, and is continuously evolving. I knew the Latina community was also evolving, and I'm very glad to know more about it. She gave three reasons for preferring the term Latina. Of these, I'm going to highlight the one that st struck me as the most ironic. The term Latinx in the first place was developed to have a more gender neutral term, but good intentions sometimes backfire. The term Latinx was adopted by academics, myself included, but never actually really accepted by the Latinx community. Less than 5% preferred that term. So, as Melissa explained, was now emerging as Latina, a term already in, in use by that community that can be Pluralized well, that's part of the language, can be said more easily. So it's up the, to the rest of us to join in with this preferred term. Related to that, and as a caveat, is her in urging us to not impose any term on any person. If I'm talking to a person of Latin descent, I will seek out their preferred term and use that. Whether they choose Venezuelan, Spanish, Latina, Latino, Latinx, it really doesn't matter. It's not my decision to make. It's that person's decision to make of how they want to be identified. And I intend to honor it. That's it. Thank you for listening. And if you want to discuss this, consider joining Pathfinders, our online membership group, where we talk about blog posts such as this and other topical areas of current interest.